Hi everybody, my name is Max Feinstein and I'm an anesthesiology resident at the Mount Sinai Hospital in New York City. I wanted to take this opportunity to spend some time reflecting on how bias in medicine does harm, particularly to our patients who are black. If our first obligation is to do no harm, then we must be aware of how our actions and also our inactions lead to harm. The purpose of this video is to reflect on bias and also what we can do about it. Do you think your medical school or hospital is free of bias towards blacks? Unfortunately, it's pretty unlikely. A study published just five years ago in 2015 showed that most healthcare providers have biases that include a positive attitude towards whites and a negative attitude towards blacks. And that's not just some small one-off study with a tiny sample size. That's from a large methodologically rigorous study that was published in a peer-reviewed high impact factor journal. Before we get too far, I think it's really important that we define our terms. So first, let's define bias. The dictionary definition is an inclination of temperament or outlook, especially a personal and sometimes unreasoned judgment. I think it's also that we bring up implicit bias, which is a term that's been used a lot in the literature and something that you ought to be familiar with if you're not already. An implicit bias is acting on the basis of prejudice and stereotypes without intending to do so. We'll circle back to that a little bit later on. The last term that I think is really important to define is racism. It's a term that's often misused and it's really helpful to understand what the difference is between bias and racism. Racism is a belief that race is the primary determinant of human traits and capacities and that racial differences produce an inherent superiority of a particular race. I bring up these definitions because there's a phenomenon that Robin D'Angelo discusses in her book called White Fragility, which is an excellent read and I highly recommend for anyone, particularly anyone who's white. But this phenomenon is that it's very easy to identify racism and it's very easy to condemn racism because it's so easy to identify. However, implicit biases can be much more elusive and a lot harder to identify, which means it's a lot harder to do something about them. So that's why I think it's important to be aware of what a bias is or an implicit bias is so that we can be better equipped with tools to identify them and do something about them. I think this is particularly relevant for medical practitioners because we typically don't see overt acts of racism on the wards, but unfortunately there are a lot more acts of implicit bias. I'd like to spend some time talking about what those acts of implicit biases are and how they harm patients. So everything that I'm about to review here is evidence-based and I included the links below so that you can see the primary literature where all of this information is coming from. The first place to start this discussion is by acknowledging that in the United States, blacks receive lower quality healthcare than whites. That's independent of disease status, clinical setting, insurance, and other clinically relevant factors. I brought up implicit bias before and I wanted to circle back to it here because there's evidence that shows that implicit bias is significantly related to patient-provider interactions, treatment decisions, treatment adherence, and patient health outcomes. Perhaps the most poignant way to summarize the impact of these claims is to realize that implicit attitudes are more often significantly related to patient-provider interactions and health outcomes than treatment processes themselves. I just want to take a moment to consider that that means that everything that you are learning or have learned in medical school and residency can be less important than biases that come into play in the patient-provider relationship. The logical implication of that is that reducing bias can do as much good as or more good than any of the treatments or medications that you're providing to patients. Here are several key findings to highlight this point. Physicians demonstrating pro-white bias were less likely to recommend thrombolysis to black patients and more likely to recommend this treatment to white patients. Additionally, pro-white bias was associated with black patients being less likely to fill prescriptions. The last point that I'll highlight here is that among black patients, provider bias was associated with less respect from providers, lower levels of liking the providers, and less willingness to recommend their provider to someone else. People have been publishing on this for decades. Unfortunately, these are not the kinds of articles that have been cited hundreds or thousands of times like the types of articles that we tend to read in medical school and residency. They really should be. So what do we do about this? The first step is that we need to identify bias. The first place to start is in the mirror. 
I'd recommend that you take this implicit bias test that's been around for a long time from Harvard and has also formed the basis for a lot of the evidence-based studies on bias in medicine. You might be surprised at the implicit biases that you have that you weren't aware of, but you might feel hopeful having recognized those biases, knowing that recognizing bias is the first step to being able to do something about that on the wards. In addition to self-reflection, we should also spend time reflecting on medical schools where our future physicians are being trained. Are there dialogues about race that are taking place in medical school? If not, there should be. Of course, we shouldn't be myopic and just think that the only place where we can have a positive impact is in the hospital itself. There was a nice editorial in JAMA in 2015 that summarizes this point well. The authors write, Many individuals live, learn, work, and play in disadvantaged contexts where it's nearly impossible to pursue healthy choices. Multi-level policies and interventions in homes, schools, neighborhoods, workplaces, and religious organizations can help remove barriers to healthy living and create opportunities to usher in a new culture of health in which the healthy choice is the easy choice. The last thing I'll mention is that this isn't just important right now. It's been important before. Unfortunately, it hasn't been addressed enough, and we need to make sure that we keep up the momentum after the protests and rallies have subsided. I'd highly encourage you to spend some time reading through some of the articles that I've cited below. There's a lot more literature out there on racism and bias in medicine, and it's worth looking at. I'd also encourage you to spend time thinking about how you can implement changes in your medical school, your residency program, the place where you work, the hiring practices at the place where you work, and, of course, in your own interactions as you work one-on-one -on -one with patients. Thanks very much for watching, and I'll see you next time.